Hello students, I am your tutor Manjeet Sembi and I shall be teaching the unit Planning Learning Activities. Planning is very essential in life and organized planning always plays a vital role in the execution of any task or activity in our life. Proper planning is a prerequisite for successful accomplishment of any task or activity. When any teaching learning activity or instructional work is planned in an organized and systematic way and executed accordingly, it brings improvement in learner performance, thereby proving the efficiency and effectiveness of the teacher. The learning objectives of this unit are distinguish between curricular and co-curricular activities that are organized in elementary schools during an academic session, Develop a yearly plan for different co-curricular activities in your school. Prepare the scheme of lessons in different subjects for different classes for the whole session. Prepare the class-wise unit plans in different subjects that you teach. Maintain and use daily lesson note or diary in your teaching subjects. As a teacher, you deal with the academic and instructional work in your institution. As a teacher, your main concern is teaching, conduct of examination, evaluation, remediation, etc. Both teaching and related instructional work that facilitate the intellectual development of the students. You are also responsible for the conduct of non-academic activities for the overall development of students' personality. Let us do a small activity. In column 1, you have to mention the activities that you do which are related to teaching and instructional work, whereas in column 2, you would be giving the activities other than teaching and instructional work. I'm sure you may have listed down your activities. Now let's see and compare the activities listed down under these two columns. Under column 1, we have teaching of subjects of study like language, mathematics, science and social science. Whereas in column 2 you have games and sports, music, dance, drama, singing, gardening, debate, excursion, exhibition, etc. Under column 1, I am sure you must have enlisted. Conduct of examinations, tests at different points in the time of the year, session or evaluation of learner performance. Whereas under column 2, you may have said that the activities that you have organized like games, sports, etc. are not compulsory and students choose according to their ability and interest. Under column 1, you must have mentioned preparation of the progress card of the students. And under column 2, you may have mentioned the activities that you conduct are called co-curricular or co-scholastic activities. The activities under column 1 whereas are called curricular or scholastic activities. So you have enlisted curricular and co-curricular activities that you organize in the school. What is the difference between the curricular and co-curricular activities? The curricular activities or scholastic activities are compulsory for all students of the class. The co-curricular or the co-scholastic activities are not compulsory for all students of the class. The curricular or the scholastic activities are mostly confined to classroom lessons. The non-scholastic activities are organized outside the classroom lessons. There is a formal timetable which is followed for the curricular or scholastic activities, whereas Co-curricular activities do not always follow a formal and rigid timetable. The curricular activities are always examined and graded at the end of the year. There is no examination like the academic subjects for the co-curricular or non-scholastic activities. So what is the relationship between the curricular and the co-curricular activities? Both the curricular and co-curricular activities are complementary to each other and they deserve equal weight and emphasis in the school curriculum. Earlier, the curricular activities were given more importance and all other activities were given very little importance 
In fact, they were considered as wasteful. Today, the co-curricular activities are given equal importance for the holistic development of students, as students can learn several skills and competencies from these activities in a real-life situation and in a joyful environment. Let us look at the example of activities like the physical activities. These could be outdoor and indoor games, sports, athletics, gardening. And what is it that they develop in the students? They develop sound physical health and fitness, develop health habits, and also facilitate normal growth and development of their body. Let's look at some activities that are good for civic development in the students. These would be activities like student self-government, a mock parliament or a court, running a cooperative store, or celebration of school festivals and other days of national importance. And what is it that they would develop among the students? Well, they would develop understanding of democratic way of life, duties, obligations and rights, and they would also acquire rich cultural experiences. So, we do need to plan both our curricular and co-curricular activities. They both complement and supplement each other and deserve equal weightage. So what are the considerations that you have to keep in mind while planning the co-curricular activities? Well, you have to keep in mind provision of time and space for the conduct of the activities, a judicious selection of the activities, provision of advice and feedback, and provision of motivation. Now let us look at each point in further detail. The judicious selection of activities. While organizing the co-curricular activities in the school, the activities should be reasonably large in number so that they cater to the interest and ability of most of the students. They should not impose an excess strain on the students because students are already strained with the academic and scholastic activities. These should be providing them with the necessary de-stressing and not excessive strain. These activities should be such that they would attract spontaneous participation of the students. They should be economical and within the limited resources of the school. These activities should not pose an additional financial burden on the school. And they should be in accordance with the student's interest and ability. Something that would appeal to the child where he would himself or herself want to learn it. Let us look at the next point, provision of time and space for conduct of the activities. All such activities are to be planned date-wise and month-wise for the whole session. So the school should be able to slate out time. Separate rooms may be allotted and used for conduct of the indoor activities. Activities like carom, chess or any other activities that are conducted within the school premises. There may be certain activities like sports, swimming, uh, camps for certain sports which may be conducted outside in the open space nearby in the school. If there is absence of adequate space and in case the school does not have its own playground, maybe permission from the civic authorities can also be sought for the same. Provision for motivation. When you want to motivate your students to participate in these activities, it is necessary that you display a long list of activities for the knowledge of all the students. And these activities should be listed out on the school information board or on a website, wherever it gets maximum publicity. This is to invite the interest of the students and help them choose for participation in specific activities. The students need to be encouraged and motivated and teachers should pose as advisors and facilitators. The function and mode of organization of each activity should be well spelt out to motivate the students. Students should know what is it that they would gain by learning a particular skill or competence through that activity. It would make more sense for them and motivate them 
in the process. Provision of advice or feedback. Each teacher in the school needs to be put in charge of any particular activity of his or her interest. This way, he or she would be able to do complete justice to that activity. The teacher should have adequate experience and also a positive attitude for organizing the concerned activities. Only then would they be able to generate enthusiasm and get students to select and opt for them. Teachers must take into account the students and the others' feedback when they are organizing these activities so that they can work on them and help in better organization. The school must have adequate equipment, materials, etc. to make these activities operational and meaningful. It would be absolutely a waste of time if you organize an activity, you have the students on the premises, but not the necessary equipment. To help them learn. There should be mutual understanding among the teachers while advising the students on a particular issue or activity. Many a times, students may be confused or may not have clarity about an activity. At such times, the teachers should help by advising. Now let us move on. Just like the distribution of the co-curricular activities throughout the academic year, the teachers also have to prepare the distribution of the curricular provisions which are prescribed for the academic year. You are prescribed a particular syllabus that you have to complete in a stipulated time frame. To complete the teaching and instructional work within the stipulated time frame of the academic session, you need to plan your teaching learning activities subject-wise and major competence-wise for different classes. Your plan needs to clearly decide and specify the following. The units as well as the subunits in a subject for a particular class. So say you are teaching mathematics. So what are the different units and subunits for mathematics in class 3 or class 4? The month and on which day or date it will be taught. You will find out which topic which unit and subunits you would be doing in which month, on what date, which day. The instructional activity that is to be undertaken on which date, day and in which month. Similarly, besides finding out, deciding on the units and subunits, you would also decide in what manner, what strategies you would be using to teach those units and subunits. Such planning of the curricular activities in a particular subject for a particular class in detail, thereby spreading it entirely over the week, month and the whole session is referred to as the scheme of lessons. So, scheme of lessons are subject specific, they are class specific and they are also major competence specific. For example, in the subject of English, you would be saying in which class you are doing it and what are the competencies that you would be developing in the students. Speaking, listening, writing, etc. Now the question that comes to our mind is, what is a syllabus and what is a scheme of lessons? So let us look at the difference between syllabus and scheme of lessons. The syllabus of a subject systematically prescribes the course contents to be taught, the course objectives, teaching methods, evaluation strategies and other related instructional work to be undertaken during the whole session. Whereas the scheme of lessons operationalize this process of teaching and instructional activities of the concerned subject and class during the whole session to accomplish the prescribed syllabus. What is the need and purpose of scheme of lessons? The main purpose of preparing the scheme of lessons is to facilitate timely and successful completion of teaching and learning of the prescribed course contents and the effective conduct of related instructional activities prescribed for the whole session. So thus very economically you would be able to make use of the time that is available to you and complete the entire prescribed 
contents of the syllabus in that stipulated period of time. What are the types of scheme of lessons that you would be preparing? We have the monthly scheme of lessons and we also have the yearly scheme of lessons. Let us look how a monthly scheme of lessons is prepared. It is prepared considering the number of working days that are available in a month, the number of periods that are devoted in a month to teaching and instructional activities of the subject concerned, apart from the other days that would be utilized for maybe a picnic or a field visit, etc. The content load and the importance of the prescribed units of the subject. So, how is the monthly scheme of lessons made? If we look at it stepwise, in the first step you study the syllabus and you enlist the units and the subunits of your subject. Then you determine the periods that you would require for each unit. You spread over the units to be taught sequentially and monthwise. Thus, you would be deciding in one month how much of content of your subject you would be teaching and on which day of a given month. This is a format. This is how a monthly scheme that you would prepare look like. So, in a particular month, what are the proposed units that you would be covering? The day and date, the number of periods you would require for every unit and then at the end of the month, you would be making a note whether you completed what you had planned and if not, the reasons why you could not complete it. Let's look at the yearly scheme of lessons. The yearly scheme of lessons is a composite scheme of the monthly scheme of lessons. How is the yearly scheme of lessons made? Now, you would be looking at the total number of periods which are available during the year and then you would take out the total number of periods which are required to complete the teaching. You would also decide the quantum of the course contents. How many units and subunits the content has, what is the complexity, how much time you need to devote to the various units and subunits. You would now spread over the units to be taught sequentially, month-wise for the entire year. And that is how you would be preparing the yearly scheme of lessons. Let us once again look at the preparation of the scheme of lessons. You would look at the actual number of working days which are available week-wise, month-wise in the entire year. Then you would see the total number of required periods for teaching a particular subject, the total number of units which are prescribed in the syllabus of that subject, the total number of subunits that are to be covered under that unit. So, you would be looking at the unit-wise concept load. Once you have gathered this data, you would look at the number of working days in a month to be actually devoted to teaching because, again, uh, there would be some periods which, be which would be allotted for teaching and some maybe for learning. For example, in language, there would be some periods on the timetable where the teacher would be teaching and some periods that would be devoted for drill practice. Similarly for maths, some would be devoted for teaching while some for practice. There are certain subjects like language, mathematics, science that would be there on all the days of the timetable, whereas others would be there for just two days in the week. So one has to see the total number of periods actually allotted for teaching a particular subject and then the number of units identified to be taught month-wise. That's how you would be preparing your scheme of lessons for the entire year. Now let us move on to the unit. Contents of every subject are arranged and organized around topics that has a number of subtopics. The content which is specific to the subtopics are dealt with in each unit. Thus a content unit represents a manageable chunk of content element. All the units together form a united and integrated whole of a meaningful and purposeful content materials and experiences. 
For example, in science, if the topic is matter, the subtopics can be solids, liquids and gases. So, solids, liquids and gases are our units. And further, when you have more content under solids, liquids and gases, they become our subunits. Thus, our subunits would be that content of a subject that can be taught within 35 to 40 minutes of a class. Now, let us look at the characteristics of a unit. The contents of a unit are always organized around a central principle, process, problem, purpose or a central topic. For instance, you may have the units like mineral resource of India, forest resources of India, around the topic of natural resources of India. You could have a topic on rights and duties of citizens and then a number of units that would be describing about the rights and duties of the citizens. The second characteristic is a unit consists of well integrated meaningful wholes which are capable of providing useful learning experiences for achieving the desired teaching learning objectives. Now if your learning objective is to develop the skill of computation then the unit should help should have that content which would help develop the skill of computation in the students. Similarly, if it would be developing the skill of observation, then the unit should have certain experiments that are being performed or maybe another kind of an activity which requires the students to develop their skill of observation. So your units should be capable of achieving certain very well defined teaching learning objectives. And the third characteristic says that a unit should represent a whole and complete subdivision of the contents of a syllabus which are useful, complete and meaningful to provide rich educational experience. So learners, in our class today, we have looked at the difference between curricular and co-curricular activities, difference between syllabus and scheme of lessons. We've also looked at monthly and yearly schemes, scheme of lessons and unit and characteristics of a unit. Thank you dear learners and we shall meet again in our next class.